What is up my dudes, my name is Eric and I made a serving tray from some resin art. That was weird. Anyway. What is up friends, thank you for joining me for yet another build, I appreciate your time as always. This time around, we're going to make a serving tray or a sushi tray from some resin art that I made. So my friends over at Moss Epoxies were kind enough to invite me out to Minnesota for a maker meetup this summer. And essentially what we did was we had a chance to go play. <laughs> So I did this ocean pour and I thought what could I possibly do with this thing rather than just hang it on the wall or look at it a lot. I thought let's make it into a functional item. So I decided I was going to play with it. So the first step when you're dealing with pouring multiple layers of epoxy is to make sure that you abrade the surface. Otherwise, bad things can happen. Now, the second thing to point out is make sure that you mix the epoxy properly. I decided that I was gonna be in a rush for absolutely seemingly no reason and didn't really fold in all of part A and part B into itself and consequently, it didn't cure properly. I got kind of a sticky mix, which is no bueno and that's entirely on me. They give you, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. They give you directions for a reason so follow the directions. Don't be all cowboy like me and just be like, I don't need to mix it for three to five minutes. One minute is good. It turns out it's not good. So maybe mix it for the full five minutes. So as you can see, it definitely didn't cure properly and it was still sticky. So I had to remove that layer and start again. It was hard enough where it didn't cause any issues gumming anything up inside the dust collector or the thicknesser. So we're okay there. Being that this was from a big box craft store, it had all of these pieces of hardware and all these staples in there. So I had to make sure that I removed that and of course, unfortunately, turned the safety off on the table saw in order to ensure that I didn't accidentally set it off. And I'm glad I did because I hit a few of those actually. Now, I am usually pouring in something that already exists or just doing a very tiny pour in the corner of a piece. Consequently, there's not a lot of weight in the pours that I do. So oftentimes, I will just use foam core as an alternative to creating these melamine forms. Those are really important when you're doing these big giant tabletop pours. But you know, these itty bitty tiny little pours that I do, it's not gonna be an issue. I face it with some uh, plastic tape and it goes I've never had an issue with it. If you're doing tiny things, works great. If you're doing anything bigger than what I'm doing right now, I would recommend you using a rigid form uh, so that the weight of the epoxy doesn't crush the form and then you have epoxy all over your shop floor, which it's less than ideal. It might make you look like you're doing things. So, you know, if you're just trying to like have people over in the shop and be like, yeah, see how much stuff I make? I have epoxy all over my floor. That could work. But if you want to actually make a project, it's probably good to use a rigid form. So as you can see here, the frame that we did the pouring was just a pine frame from one of the big box craft stores. And it worked great to hold the resin in. However, it doesn't look great as a finished product. Just cut that bloody thing off and let's make a new frame for it. So then I set about my business making the trim for the box, which is super simple. It's just some curly maple that I had lying around. I cut it down to about a quarter inch higher than what it was going to be in the end and trimmed it to length. I really took my time in making sure that they were the perfect length because there's not a lot of play here. And if those miters don't match up, it ruins the entire effect of this tray. It's not hard to do that if you take your time and you build a proper sledge and you make sure that your blade is at 45 degrees, but make sure you're paying attention to detail because this doesn't have very many details. So the details have to be right. 
And then I'm a big fan of using a tape clamp for projects as small as this. Tape is a perfectly wonderful clamp as long as it's nice and tight and it has some flexibility and it did everything I needed it to here, really cleaned up nice and tight, cut that tape so I could fold it back and continue to work while I was drying, but that's it. So once it's dry, I took it to the workbench and I cleaned up the bottom first because there's of course gonna be a little bit of overhang. So I took it with a card scraper and a hand plane, just cleaned it up, sanded it back, made sure that everything was nice and flush and pretty. And then it's time for the final coat of epoxy. So this one is so thin that I actually brushed it on to make sure that I could keep it as thin as possible. Took my time, tried not to get it on the actual trim itself and playing a little air piano. You know, some folks play air guitar. I like to play air piano. What can I say? And then it's time to shape the outside of the tray itself. So I didn't want this to be super boxy. This is a nice delicate item and just having that really flat, rigid frame around it, it just felt wrong to me. It needed a little bit of lift, needed a little bit of touch, a little bit of curve. But I think it adds a lot of lift to this piece just to have a little bit of a curve there. It's nicer to touch, it's nicer to look at. It's a tiny little detail that most folks will overlook, but it makes a big difference in the final presentation. Then I started milling up some stock to make the feet. I wanted to give it just a little bit of lift, and the only way that I could do that is to create essentially a spacer between the bottom of the tray and the ground. And so I milled these very, very thin. I, I think it was less than an eighth, and just doubled them up with some double stick tape. Cut them out on the scroll saw or the band saw or by hand if you don't have any of that, and took it over to the belt sander to shape it. Now placement of these feet actually does matter because if they're too close to the edge, you're gonna see the feet and it won't have that feel of just being lifted off the ground. But if they're too close together, the board's gonna wobble when you put things on it. So I tried a couple of different orientations and essentially got them as close to the edge as I could without you being able to see them when you're looking at it. And you, you know, folks think glue is just for gluing things. Glue can also be used as clamps. So make sure you keep a nice heavy bottle of glue or a weight around in case you just need to stack some things on top of it. Pro tip. Now, so it is a serving tray. In my mind, it's kind of a sushi tray. And so I wanted to make a pair of chopsticks to go with it just because I thought that that would kind of up the value a little bit, up the presentation. It would be more intriguing as a set than it would be as a piece on its own. So I decided I was gonna make some chopsticks. What I did was I started by making a jig, which is essentially just a tapering jig. So I took a piece of poplar, milled it flat, and then cut it on the bandsaw to taper it from one side to the other. Now an issue I ran into with just putting that single spacer because that piece of poplar is as thin, it is, as, thin as it is, is the thicknesser was putting pressure in the middle and actually flexing that piece of poplar. So when it's doing this and taking a shaving flat across, when it actually flattens out, you end up with this hump right here. And that's what you can see right here on the screen. So understanding what went wrong, I went back and added different thickness spacers where they needed to be to give it more support in the center, sent it to the thicknesser again, and then I had a nice flat jig, which is all I was after in the first place. Initially, my idea for the jig was to keep the stop for the chopsticks integrated into the original piece, but I ended up removing that integral part in the end anyway, as you can see here, and then I just added a spacer onto the bottom to get that taper that I wanted after running it through the jig. Then I went ahead and milled up some poplar blanks. You're gonna see me making the chopsticks out of poplar, and then I'm gonna switch to the curly maple, which is the final chopstick, but I'm doing the operations back to back. So I'm making the poplar chopsticks, and then I'm running that same operation with the curly maple chopsticks, but rather than watching me do it twice, I'm just gonna show you the poplar sticks. So I run it through the thicknesser to give it a shot, and what ends up happening is at the thin end, the chopsticks start bouncing in the thicknesser like that and it creates this chatter, which is no bueno. So I solved that issue by simply putting a piece of double stick tape down and setting them back in the thicknesser, and this takes care of the problem and works great. And then it's time for the inlay. Now, the inlay can be as intricate as you want. My buddy Paul at Copper Pig, I know it's Copper Pig, Copper Pig, 
furniture, copper pig woodworks. I'll link him down in the description down below. Good dude, funny dude. Check him out. Makes a single line out of brass. It's beautiful. I'll show you a picture of the set that I made with him right here. So I decided to put a little dot just to give it a little contrast. But in order to do that and get that dot the right size, I had to make a dowel. And a nice trick that I use fairly regularly is to chuck a piece up in the drill press and then actually use the dowel plate to run it up the piece of wood to create a dowel. It's a little bit brutal with something this small. It can break, so just be careful, but it works like aces. And then I just use a little dab of super glue, put the dowel in, cut it flush, and clean it up, and it's good to go. Now, I use a block plane here to clean this up. If you don't have a block plane, you can use sandpaper, you can use a chisel, you can use a myriad of different techniques to clean it up flush. And in fact, you see me right here using a different technique just to show you that you can use a chisel to flush those pieces up. And then I use that same stop and chisel to taper the ends to give it a little bit of visual interest so that it doesn't just come up to a square end. And after a sanding to clean up the faces and clean up the corners, it's time to throw a coat of finish on. And boy howdy, man, this thing started to pop when I got a coat of finish on. The curly maple looks great with the ocean pour. The chopsticks look fantastic sitting on that sushi board. I really, really like the way that this came out. One last thing I do want to address. I know that epoxy is not FDA approved for food safety. So in order to make this food safe, what I did and what I didn't actually film is me doing a final coat of shellac just on top of the epoxy to give a nice barrier between the plastic and what the food comes in contact with. That all being said, thank you again for joining me for another video. Please make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that bell. It helps me out as I'm trying to grow this channel and hopefully allows me to continue to bring you guys interesting content. Let me know what you think of the video in the comments down below and make sure you check out the links below for some of the items that I used in this build if you are interested in doing the same. I appreciate you coming by and spending some time with me as always. And friends, I will see you in the next video. Lord willing in the creek don't rise. Peace. Some friends of mine and myself, pro tip. Well, I guess it is a Monday. People are actually working. Who works anymore? Come on, man, it's 2019. 30 minutes.